I'm going to be talking about privacy and big data research. So um, I'm sure most of you have probably have some kind of social media account. You probably have some kind of a membership card to your local grocery store. Does anybody get freaked out when they start doing a search on Google and it gives them all of the things that they were just talking about randomly? And they're like, is my Google Home listening to me? Okay, so that's the kind of stuff that big data is. Um, it's the predictive advertisements, that sort of thing. The, um, you get the coupons in, in your mail about what kind of stuff you typically buy at the grocery store. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that big data is used for. But um, it's also used in healthcare. And so these are different sources of big data in healthcare. So um, government agencies, so CDC, um, actually the, the Census Bureau also has a lot of data. Patient portals, so my chart, um, my health, that kind of stuff. Research studies, generic databases, um, EHR, so IHIS, public records, so any data that's published from re research, um, search engine data, wearable devices, smartphones, payer records, government agency. Oh, I want to cover it. So basically, these are all the different sources of big data, not just for healthcare, but specifically for healthcare, um, as, it, as I'll, we'll talk about today. And so there's a lot of different things that big data can be used for in healthcare that isn't just being creepy. Um, so it can really help with diagnostics, um, data mining and an analysis to identify causes of illness. So that's, again, some, something that if you see consistently a person who has, you know, this, um, these notes written in their medical record, maybe they have this type of disease. Um, preventative medicine, again, if you notice that someone has diabetes, maybe you can help them uh, work on a better nutrition profile. Um, preci precision medicine, um, aggregate, aggregate data, so a lot of Genetic data is used towards precision medicine, but there's a lot more that's going into it. Uh, medical research, um, I mean, I, we all participate in medical research. Reductions of adverse medication events. Um, so again, things that you may not think of as being an adverse event, if you see a particular trend in a large set of data, you might be able to pinpoint the cause of that. Cost reduction, uh, one way that we actually as a medical center reduce costs is by using computer assisted coding, uh, which is something that they analyze the text within the medical record and make sure that the coding is being done properly, which can re reduce billing errors. Um, and population health, so things like epidemiology. So the reason we're talking about this today um, is that the Office of Human Research Protections, OHRP, did an exploratory workshop in September that was titled Privacy and Health Research in a Data-Driven World. And so that's, um, it's the, the entire presentation is available online. Uh, a few of us sat in a, in a room in prior and watched the whole thing and kind of discussed about certain things as we went through. Um, and so we're gonna show you a couple of presentations, well, one entire presentation and a portion of another presentation that we thought, thought was particularly relevant to uh, the folks in the room. Um, so the, like I said, everything's available online, the slides, the talks themselves, um, the agenda, everything is available online. And I have that website here for your reference. Um, the first thing that we're gonna watch is it's the very opening presentation, just kind of put everything in perspective and, and see what some of the challenges are with big data, um, specifically with health, but also just in general. Um, and the, the first pres presenter is Jacob Metcalf, um, who's a PhD and kind of an interesting guy. And let me see, oh shoot. So bear with me while I find his presentation. That bridges multiple dimensions of a person's life. 
data uses, as well as um, important trust in how we're using that data. Um, there are lots of different frameworks that we'll be talking about, about how we think about privacy and data protection, and um, how the regulatory environment impacts that, uh, that context. So lots to cover, lots of really interesting conversation. Um, we're going to have our panelists talk each for about 20 minutes to introduce these topics, and then we'll have an hour-long discussion, moderated discussion afterwards. So with that, I will turn it over to Jake to begin our discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jody. I, so uh, I was asked to um, provide some some framing concepts um, to discuss sort of broadly. Yeah. Um, to provide some framing concepts. Uh, around uh, ethics and privacy in big data uh, uh, research, both in the academy and industry. Um, and so I'm going to focus on actually the junction between those two uh, and how uh, data, uh, big data research in the academy uh, becomes mobile within an industry in a way that causes uh, unexpected harms. Um, I'm uh, here from uh, representing uh, uh, Pervade, Pervasive Data Ethics for Computational Research. Uh, it's an NSF grant, um, uh, seven co-PIs, including uh, Michael Zimmer, who's here today. Um, and we're studying how stakeholders are responding to research ethics and data science and promulgating best practices. Um, and so we're, it's a, a group that's building a, um, collaborative uh, data sets and research projects in many different areas around um, data research, especially as it, as data scientists uh, consider more robustly um, how to do ethical, re ethical and responsible research practices. Okay, well, why do we say pervasive data ethics? Well, big data is really an industry term. It doesn't actually describe what's relevant about data uh, research these days. Um, we found that pervasive data is a far more accurate term. Um, that's because uh, pervasive describes data that bridges multiple dimensions of a person's life. All right, so you know, we tend to experience um, ourselves as having uh, you know multiple different um, uh, persons in a sense, like who we are with our doctor, who we are with our lawyer, who we are with our teachers, who we are with our children, um, and we tend to not think that those things have overlap. The machines don't care, right? Uh, machines uh, uh, wants to gobble all of that together, um, and uh, unless we have uh, clear and robust uh, uh, policy uh, distinctions, um, those will all be analyzed together. So we're going to look at what happens um, when uh, those dis distinctions collapse. Um, it's also the nature of machine learning to jump domains, and the real economic value, well, the intellectual and economic value of uh, data analytics, especially when machine learning is involved, uh, is the ability to make inferences about one part of your life uh, from another part of your life. And in particular, to take cheap data and make expensive inferences, right? So the, the economic engine of machine learning is to find data that's cheap to get or free to get um, and make inferences about aspects of your life that are very hard or expensive to get, valuable, right? Um, and then we also see that the speed and scale of data analytics, um, particularly when machine learning is involved, uh, changes the dimensionality of ethical risk. Um, there are, uh, what we'll find in many cases is that um, uh, the framework of indi individual privacy uh, doesn't uh, cover, it's not that it's inapplicable, but rather that there are a number of kinds of harms that occur that can't be captured um, through an individual frame. But that rather, we need to be looking at downstream consequences to communities and society at large. Okay. Now, why is you know uh, why is big data so hard for research ethics to get a handle on? Um, my contention is that it's because most of the techniques, tools, methods, concepts of uh, data research uh, 
it's poorly compatible with um, uh, our institutions, our uh, concepts, our language, our rules around uh, research ethics. And in particular, that's because pervasive data science uses uh, these categories of, uh, the, uses these methods and types of data that largely exempt it from the common rule, right? So most, perva most pervasive data science research uses pre-existing data sets. It uses public data sets, which often means borrowed, bought, or gleaned from internet services. And it uses data that's been sufficiently de-identified to qualify as exempt, right? So in most cases, data scientists aren't involved in the collection of data and therefore actually aren't that closely, um, uh, they, they don't dwell, uh, their methods aren't close to uh, the sort of key moments of research ethics. It comes after the data has already been collected um, and uh, almost universally their research is exempt um, under the common rule. Pervasive data science risks are mostly or uniquely downstream, um, thereby excluding those harms from the purview of IRBs that use the common rules guidance to attend to harms that are done to the research subjects themselves and not to society. Um, and pervasive data doesn't require interventions typically. So, you know, the common rule specifically um, describes research as something that requires an intervention in a person's life. Uh, data scientists typically aren't drawing blood or giving interviews, right? Um, they are handling data that already exists somewhere in the world that someone else already collected. Um, and uh, oddly, uh, uh, data science tools, because they're so prolific and easy to access on the internet, um, uh, means that anyone can be a researcher, right? So we have, um, in a way that we don't have a proliferation of theoretical physicists or um, clinical psychologists, we have a proliferation of people with access to these kinds of scientific tools, right? And so um, the uh, relying on institutional review boards misses a lot of the science that happens, uh, potentially, because many, of the, many people are not actually in an institution. Um, this is from a survey that, uh, that uh, Michael uh, has been working on, um, sort of preliminary research. These are just, uh, essentially, it's a word cloud of terms that uh, NSF-funded data science research has used to describe methods. So. Um, these are terms um, that we'll see quite often in the research projects that we've been studying. So clickstream, Twitter feed, data from Facebook, GPS data, user data, private user, um, app data, right? So there's sort of a word cloud of, um, you know, what does pervasive data research really make use of? All right, excuse my, excuse my very crude graphics. <laughs> find it easier just to make them simple um, uh, rather than pretty. So um, the, the key point, I think, I claim, the key point of risk uh, in data science research, particularly as it moves from the academy to industry, involves modeling. So traditional research methods, um, we study populations, to produce a model that predicts what a population will do, right? We, inter we interview individuals, we draw blood from individuals, we um, study their behavior in a, in a particular setting. Um, but the goal is the models that get produced in traditional research tells us about populations. However, the exact same tools you would use to model that population um, with big data, one, uh, those, that exact same model, right? A, a, um, a machine learning model is essentially a set of mathematical weights that says, if such and such happens, um, uh, weight a prediction in this way. And if this other thing happens, weight the prediction slightly differently. And if this other thing happens, weight the prediction slightly differently, right? that ex exact same set of mathematical weights to make a prediction plugs right into targeting intervention tools, All right? So the, the distinction that we would find in traditional research projects between study and intervene, right? That distinction is inoperable if you're using machine learning tools because the exact same set of mathematical weights that you would use to understand the population allows you to target 
an individual, right? So models really become the crux of privacy. It's not just what do we end up, it, we're not just trying to protect, we shouldn't be just trying to protect, protect this person from harm in the research method, but we should also be paying attention to what happens to this model such that it now allows you to target other individuals in a live fashion in the real world, okay? This is what I call the, uh, the value ratchet of machine learning. We find behavior through sensors or signals, right? So, uh, you know, most of the time that means your phone that's in your pocket, studying everything you're doing. Um, but also there's, you know, there's many, many sensors in the world. Um, we collect information about behavior from sensors. It's a signal that gets integrated into a data profile, is analyzed in order to make a prediction in order to leverage behavior, right? Every turn of, uh, every turn of this ratchet creates economic or um, scientific value. Let me show you. The data subject um, uh, understands their behavior and often understands the sensor, right? Think about um, a, a fitness tracker on your wrist, right? Many people love their fitness trackers. They understand what they're doing. They're counting their steps. They look at it every day. It's a somewhat intimate relationship. You know what your fitness tracker is doing because it feeds back to you. The behavior, the behavior signal loop is clear to you, right? What you don't see is the rest of the value ratchet, the rest of the economy. You don't see the integration into a data profile that includes a bunch of other information about you, right? You don't see how it is that the agreement between the fitness tracker manufacturer and the um, insurance company that your employer uh, uh, signed you up for uh, integrates into their platform that makes predictions about your health and how it's gonna shape your insurance next year, right? The analysis happens um, in order to get to prediction, right? This is the economically valuable portion of the predictive ecosystem, yet it remains opaque to the individual. The value is in the ability to leverage this information to get um, uh, changes in behavior. This is what we experience as creepy, right? Um, when, we say, when we say the data company did this thing that feels creepy, what we really mean is um, we thought we understood what was going on, and, but we didn't see the rest of the ratchet. We didn't see how they were getting to economic value, okay? This is an important part of um, understanding research ethics risk, even though this is not how research happens, right? So this is a technical stack, as they call it in industry. Um, uh, we, uh, in industry, you move from sensor data collection to a data lake, which basically, you know, um, tech companies seem to be magical, but really in a way they're just managed disasters. Um, and the data lake is the main disaster uh, and that is just the collection of the enormous amount of sensor data that is uh, coming in. Um, it's all pooled together. Um, and a lot of their technical tools further down the line are about picking out the parts of the, you know, the, the drops from the lake that are relevant, right? So um, you get the data lake. Um, there's often whole teams of data engineers that just manage what is the lake doing. Um, uh, data scientists want to find that um, you know, in a smaller unit, a data set. But really what they're interested in is the feature set. So, um, uh, you know, a, a data set might come from many different places, but what they're interested in is the features, right? Uh, if you're a row in the, uh, in, the, in the data set, the feature is the column, right? It's your geolocation, uh, it's your age, it's your economic data, all that stuff, right? So what they want to find is the features across multiple data sets. They want to feed that into a learning algorithm in order to produce a model. So this is the activity of data science in a technology company. This is what a data scientist is doing all day, is um, uh, trying, to, trying to develop an economically valuable uh, prediction uh, that is um, uh, optimized to use the fewest number of electrons to uh, make a prediction based on uh, the smallest possible feature set, right? They want computationally efficient predictions uh, that produce economic value. 
ultimately what that model is supposed to do is become a productionized model, which is fed live data in order to produce the product or service or scientific output. Importantly, every step down this chain produces more economic value, but it also loses context. As it gets further away from sensor and data collection, ethically relevant context is stripped. The model is a highly abstract set of mathematical weights in a predictive system, right? You don't, uh, the whole point of making a model is to strip context, right? And these technical systems aren't capable of handling um, context as a sort of metadata, typically, um, that you would want to, you, that you would want to have on hand if you were to make uh, a robust ethical decision about whether this product or service should be out in the world. Most of our ethical controls are up at sensor or data collection, but all of the economic value is further, is much further down the chain of technical, um, of the technical system, right? And as you get, as you have less context, you become more portable, right? So this model can be used for many different things in many different contexts, right? Because it is the most, it's the most abstract component of the system. Okay, now I'm going to persuade you that Cambridge Analytica is actually a uh, health research ethics scandal. All right, we mostly talked about it as Zuckerberg in front of conference, in front of Congress, sweating bullets um, because of the massive amount, a uh, massive privacy violation that occurred. It was a significant privacy violation. Right, it harmed individuals. We can understand. It, it's not illegitimate to use a framing of individual privacy to understand what happened. But in the background, that economic ratchet um, of moving from individuals to populations to predict and leverage individuals is really where the meat of the story is. You have to understand a little bit about the political context. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best to be entirely non nonpartisan about this, um, but um, the uh, uh, you have uh, a critical part of the story is the race between the two major political parties in the United States uh, to achieve dominance in electoral data systems. All right. So um, on the day of the election, uh, Mitt Romney's of uh, the 2012 pr uh, uh, presidential election, uh, Mitt Romney's uh, campaigns get out the vote effort collapsed. So the technical system failed. All right. Um, and uh, that, 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 that was after an enormous investment from the uh, Republican Party and its donors in order to catch up to the Obama campaign um, uh, uh, with these new data systems, right? Um, and the Romney system uh, on the day of the election collapsed. And so they actually couldn't do the get out the vote door knocking campaign uh, that had been planned for, right? And many of the leaders in the Republican Party said, um, uh, this, uh, this is why we lost this campaign. They were actually quite confident, uh, that they, uh, their polling said that they were going to win. Um, and that the, the narrow difference between did you go out and knock on the doors and make the phone calls they thought was actually the cause of, um, uh, the Obama victory in that context, immediately after the election, as political parties always do, they, they held a post-mortem meeting for their leadership and their donors and their thinkers and their consultants to all get together uh, and discuss uh, what went well, what didn't go well. At that campaign, or sorry, at that meeting in New York in January 2013, were, um, was uh, Rebecca and Robert Mercer. Uh, Robert Mercer is one of the leading donors to uh, conservative politics in the United States. Um, but it's critically important to understand who he is. He invented algorithmic hedge fundry. So he became quite wealthy, one tiny, tiny victory at a time times a trillion, right? You know, tiny fractions of a penny per trade advantage at tremendous scale and speed. Um, so he believes in tiny victories at a time, right? It's his philosophy. It's what he was, he's really good at, using math to get tiny victories at a time, or at, at scale, right? Rebecca Mercer is his daughter. Um, she's really, uh, she's, the one that you'll actually find interacting with the media, so she's often sort of the face of their family, uh, whereas he is uh, much more quiet. Um, also there was Alexander Nix, the CEO of uh, Strategic Communications Laboratory, a, uh, a British 
um, military intelligence firm uh, whose primary clients are like the American Department of Defense, um, uh, the State Department, uh, the British MI5, MI6, um, providing uh, data-driven electoral intelligence about non-Anglo-American countries. Right? Um, so they have significant electoral data operations going on around the world. They have a lot of you know, uh, cutting-edge techniques also, there was Steve Bannon, who at the time was the, uh, you know, the head of Breitbart News, um, so a significant communication strategist for conservative politics in the United States, and Mark Block, um, who is famously Herman Cain's um, campaign manager, but also um, uh, he runs a lot of conservative uh, political action committees. These are the people that made Cambridge Analytica on that boat, right? It was the decision of the Mercers to invest in intellectual property from SCL, with Steve Bannon as the vice president and Mark Block as um, uh, sort of in charge of collecting data through his political action case to fine tune the models. So Cambridge Analytica really isn't its own company, it's a shell company holding intellectual property, right, for use in the United States. What does it have to do with health research? At that same time in the world, so when this group of, um, of um, you know, high-powered political thinkers in the United States decide we need a new way of doing political data, right? We're in need of a new kind of system. There's this happening in England um, at, at the University of Cambridge uh, Psychometrics Center, right? So psychometrics is the uh, measurement of psychological and psychiatric traits uh, quantitatively, uh, particularly through data operations. So Michael Kaczynski and David Stilwell are really uh, the big players here. Uh, Kaczynski is now at uh, Stanford, um, Stillwell. I, th I think Stillwell is still at Cambridge, but I'm not totally sure of that. Um, so they put out this paper, private traits and attributes are predictable from digital records of human behavior. Um, and uh, right, right, this, is, this, uh, this is a month after the Cambridge Analytica meeting in New York. Um, and the idea here is to take personality characteristics um, uh, that are measurable and correlate them to activities in social media networks. So the, the primary framework is called OCEAN, openness, consciousness, extroversion, agreeables, agreeableness, and eroticism. So openness is, uh, do you like new experiences? Conscientiousness is, um, how orderly are you? Extroversion, of course, is how much, how social are you? Agreeableness is, um, how do you feel about conflict? And neuroticism is how do you feel about threats? So we all fall on a spectrum of each of these traits, high and low. Um, this is a well, you know, uh, the, the, it's called Ocean or the Big Five or the uh, FFM, the five feature model, I think. Um, there's also 13 feature models and um, there's lots of debates um, in the psychological community about the validity of these structures. Um, how, you know, how many traits do we all really have? But the general idea is that we all have a matrix of quantifiable traits. Every human is measurable in that way. Um, and uh, these are traits that are useful um, in, uh, all in many different contexts, but in particular in, psychi in psychiatry, right? So these, are, um, the, these type of measurements are integrated with the DSM-5. Um, these, these are psychiatric categories, right? They get used a lot for other things that aren't explicitly clinical, but fundamentally these are well-validated psychiatric tools. What do they do? They collect your likes, right? So uh, using viral quizzes, which I'll explain next, um, they collect the things that you like on Facebook and they're able to predict with significant um, uh, accuracy a number of demographic and psychological traits. So uh, they're able to predict um, are you Christian or uh, Islamic? Uh, do you smoke cigarettes? Uh, what is your sexual preference? Your gender? Uh, how do you vote? Um, you know, uh, the diversity of your friendship network, your age. So based on just simply the things that you like on Facebook, they're able to measure that. Uh, Kozinski says in an interview, with a mere 10 likes his input, his model could appraise a person's character better than the average coworker. With even, uh, with, with more than 300 likes, uh, you can predict um, what, a, what a person thinks, you can predict a person's behavior better than they can themselves, 
as his clan, right? right. So um, what you like on Facebook is a more consistent predictor of what you will do and who you are than your own self-assessment as his clan. So how do they do this? Viral quizzes. They say, hey, take our super fun personality tests on Facebook. You say, neat, sure thing. At the time, Facebook's API policy, API is Application Programming Interface. Um, it allows you to, it, that's what allows third parties to get data from Facebook. At the time, Facebook's API policy allowed, as soon as you hit neat, sure thing button, okay, right? It says okay, really you're saying neat. Um, what that does is um, uh, the, uh, the, Cambridge, the Cambridge Psychometric Center people um, get all of your friends and their likes and all of your likes. It's fed through Facebook's API into their, their psychiatric metrics uh, uh, analysis. That gets fed back to you as quiz results, but the important thing is it becomes part of their database and models, right? So you click OK, and all of your friends and all of their likes become part of that database and become, become part of the predictive model. These are many of the traits that are collected. Um, really what's very important is this becomes economically valuable because of Facebook's other feature of custom audiences. Well, Nix and Bannon hear about this, and they approach these researchers at Cambridge and say, um, hey, can we license your model? Stillwell and Kaczynski decline. But they go immediately right down the hall to their colleague, Alexander Kogan, and say, hey, can you replicate this research? Um, uh, we'll give you what we offered them, and they didn't take. He says, yes. Uh, he, needs, he wants research funding. The deal is basically they'll license the models, and they'll pay for his research, right? This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme for him. Um, uh, it's a license in exchange for funded research, which, of course, is a common relationship in academia. Kaczynski sets out, um, he, uh, he incorporates uh, Global Sciences Laboratory um, and sets out to do the same viral quizzes involving um, and, and using mTurk workers. So Amazon Mechanical Turk is a way you can get people to do cheap, repetitive work on a computer, um, pennies at a time. He pays a very small amount. Along the way, violates terms of services for both Facebook and mTurk which is very important. So we know we have a record of complaints uh, uh, from MTurk workers about the violation of terms of services in these quizzes. Meanwhile, Kogan and his US compatriots are seeking ethics committee approval. The UC Riverside IRB approves it immediately. They're fine with it because it, it counts as exempt under the common rule. The UK Research Ethics Committee at Cambridge says no way, repeatedly. In fact, this review that we, get, that we have through FOIA, the British equivalent of FOIA um, uh, says this is the first time I've ever refused an application. I've gone through it multiple times, and I can see all the ways that this is highly problematic. It's deceptive. Uh, Facebook's API policy is not conducive to ethical research. You should not be doing this. All right? The result of that, as far as we can tell, no academic research was ever published. Right. This became, of course, an enormous international uh, political incident, but no academic research ever came of it. Came of it. But here's Hogan saying, I'm not interested in dragging. Uh, he says, um, uh, this research was, in fact, approved by the project in one day. Sorry, this was approved by the institution, the IRB, in one day, finding it entirely exempt from ethics considerations. I have a collection of data scientists misusing the term exempt on Twitter. Um, it's a very common mistake to say that exempt means responsible. But of course, exempt doesn't mean responsible. Exempt means uh, technically falls under the rules as defined in the common rule. All right. So why is all of this useful? It's useful because Facebook has a tool that enables you to find proxy profiles. This makes sense if you're selling shoes, right? If I'm, I'm a sneaker store, I want to find, uh, yeah. I, I know, I have one minute. Uh, a sneaker store can target men aged 18 to 30 who live nearby, like wrap and shoes. Um, however, knowing these profiles, these psychological profiles, allows a political advertiser to find people based on their personality and geolocation and to tailor um, uh, psychologically, uh, to create psychologically tailored content. 
Cambridge Analytica, while working for uh, the Trump campaign, claimed to test 175,000 psychologically tailored unique ads in one day. Right? So this is a largely automated process. They use these models that were built for research. They plug it into a commercial application, the exact same model that was the research model, right? to predict what, you would, what kind of political advertising is most useful for you individually. Right? So again, we take what, what, what we'll see over and over again um, is these hallmarks of a research ethics scandal in the age of pervasive data. Metrics jumping between domains, from psychiatry to social media to electoral data. And it's because of that, that value of the model to target individuals. Models are no longer about populations, they're about targeting individuals. Um, we also see uh, things like um, exempt on the common rule for narrow reasons, blurred lines between academic and commercial, abuse of MTurk workers. I think this is um, uh, highly, um, this is a strong signal of unethical research, yet it's very common um, in social science particularly. Uh, de de deceptive and opaque recruiting tactics. Um, and, and most importantly, the downstream effects of research like this are nearly impossible to imagine because the models are highly portable and far more valuable than the data, right? We pay attention to the data, but we don't pay attention to the models. And therefore, it becomes very hard to track the consequences of the stuff once it's out in the world. Um, so, uh, just need to acknowledge NSF funding um, and folks who helped uh, contribute to this research. Thank you. All right. So, anybody going to think twice before they do their next viral quiz? I certainly was a little freaked out after I watched this. Um, so, it, he brings up a lot of stuff that we're seeing actually even just now in the, the media where Facebook is being um, targeted for doing the targeted ads. And they've also been reprimanded for racially profiling people um, for, for housing ads and for job ads and that, that sort of thing. So this is very um, present everywhere in our lives, really. Um, uh, and the, the other thing I wanted to kind of that information about Cambridge Analytica kind of threw me for a loop. I thought, I thought it was a little complicated. So bottom line is that people were giving permission for other people's information. So I as, a fr as, I as a person was giving permission for my friends to give their data. And the other problem was that the, the way that this whole thing was set up was such that it was only supposed to be used for research. It wasn't supposed to be used for targeting political ads. So those are kind of the two <coughs> big takeaways that I got from that. Okay, so why is this so hard? Why are we going from modeling behavior to political ads? Um, and one of the reasons is that privacy is difficult to define. So I'm gonna show you guys, just it's just a couple more minutes and I think you'll get a kick out of it. Um, from this presentation, and I'm gonna do the timing better this time. Places where I have a Band-Aid, a five-year-old boy. So uh, naked. She, she asked different people to draw what their, what their definition of policy or of privacy was. Body, woman in her 30s, what's, what's in my mind? A 12th grader. At privacy policies, male in his 40s, right? Uh, my right as a citizen, a 12th grader. Things I can control, an eighth grade male, not spilling out everything on Instagram. <laughs> Things I lock and keep secure, a 10th grade, 10th grade girl. My closed bedroom door, female in her 60s. My internet activity, a woman in her 20s. Anyone in here think internet activity is private? I don't. Uh, the potty, three and a half year old boy. You can probably tell what he was working on at that point. Uh, being anonymous in a crowd, a woman in her 20s. 
Um, and this is one of my favorites. I don't know what it is, but the government doesn't respect it, right? Seventh grade male, unbelievable, I think, uh, for, for a child that age. Um, and here's the 10th grade boy. Actually, nothing's private. So I think, you know. All right, so that's, that's one of the bi biggest things. And she goes on to um, explain her research into kind of how people view privacy differently. Um, actually, I encourage you to watch her whole presentation. We just didn't have enough time to go through it today. But essentially, she, she found that people define privacy depending on the situation they're in and depending on the, their experiences that they've had in the past. So that's one of the reasons why it's hard. I, as a person, cannot say what Abby feels is private. So when we're reviewing things, we can't necessarily protect everyone and how they feel. There's multiple sets of regulations. So as Jacob said, um, there's these, this type of research tends to evade IRB review, but it can also apply to uh, FERPA regulations. They, he mentioned Europe, the GDPR, the general data, data previous privacy regulations um, that can come into effect. So there's different, it's a moving target um, as to what regulations actually apply and what's required. And informed consent is difficult. How many of you guys actually read your data use agreements when you do, I'm gonna try this ad or this, this app? How many of you actually read them? Guessing nobody. So there's, there is some movement towards um, making those a little bit more simplified, but there's always that legal, okay, but if we don't, it's kind of the, the informed consent conundrum. You know, do you give them 20 pages of a consent because it lists everything, or do you give them the things that are most likely to happen, but then if something happens that's not on that list, what do you do? So um, that's, those are kind of the problems that we're facing with big data. Good news is we have some of that under wraps um, at OSU. And so uh, the biggest thing that we have regard, as it specifically relates to healthcare is the HIPAA steering committee. Um, so we keep, we, we are a hybrid entity. We keep all of the covered components kind of up to date. Um, and each year, each covered component has to do a self-assessment. Uh, so they go through and re review their their policies and um, how they're doing. And that's, for the medical center, that's kind of an easy thing to do because that's our bread and butter. For schools like um, dentistry, optometry, they're much smaller. They don't have as many resources as we do. Um, so it's good for them to kind of take that moment and, and review what they're doing. We also have the Health Information Systems Access Review Committee, is ARC. If you're from outside of the College of Medicine, you probably hate me. Um, we evaluate the need for non-clinical IHIS access. So anyone, any researchers who do not otherwise have IHIS access, we review that. Um, and we limit the access as much as possible. Um, and one of the things that we have started looking at is evaluating recruitment strategy. So in other words, we don't want a researcher walking up to a patient they don't know and saying, hi, how are you? You have HIV. Can I talk to you about a research study? Um, and then we also have the Honest Broker Operations Committee, which you guys have heard uh, us talk about in the, the past. Um, this is for things more closely related to big data. Um, this is information that comes from IW. And we evaluate the need for patient data for research purposes. Um, so if somebody really doesn't need personal level data, we can try to persuade them to do de-identified. Um, and we can evaluate, again, re recruitment strategy. A lot, of a lot of the requests that come in are, you know, we want a list of patients who have diabetes. So we can send them a letter to tell them that, that we'd like them to participate in this trial. But we try as much as we possibly can to to get a clinical link to that person so that we're not just rooting around in people's medical charts and saying, oh, you know, I found you. You've got these three numbers, so I'm going to look around your charts more. So we're trying to make them, we try to get that clinically relevant so that um, the patients are have that connection to their clinical care. 
And some ongoing upcoming initiatives. Um, so the creation of the university privacy officer position, who's Holly Drake, um, she's presented in this forum before. She's amazing. She's doing all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the things that she's started with is aligning the HIPAA practices across the covered components. So although we keep in touch with everybody, uh, different, different covered components have different policies and different ways of doing things. Um, again, partially because some of the components don't have the resources that the medical center does. Um, and we're trying to make sure that things are being done consistently across the, the various covered components. We've also created a privacy, security, and human subjects research task force, which is doing all kinds of stuff. Um, it started as trying to get the IRB's approval of things like recruitment practices more in line with what the medical center was evaluating. Um, so things like not recruiting from Gmail accounts, but using secure email. Um, so it, it started with that and kind of ballooned out to a whole bunch of different things. Um, there's, there's work on security, so getting more secure storage for folks who are outside of the medical center or the College of Medicine, because they don't have the resources, again, that we do. Um, things like uh, defining what research data is so that we have a, a better understanding of how PHI needs to be stored and treated versus how research data has to be stored and treated. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going into that. Um, and then we're also working on, uh, myself and one of the privacy people, are working on updating the medical center policy regarding the use of PHI for research purposes. So um, there's an existing policy, it's 0911, which is the medical center staff use of PHI which I'm not expecting any of you to have read. Um, but there's part of it refers to research specifically. And it's we've been trying to update it for a few years, but we're really starting to hit that hard um, and pull it out to its own policy so that we can be more clear about things like cold calling uh, and things like that as it relates specifically to the medical center. So um, in addition to that, um, which I don't have specifically up here, there is talk of having an additional type of review um, compared to just having IRB review. Because again, as you saw, a lot of these projects, these big data projects are exempt from IRB review, but that doesn't mean that something bad can't happen. So we're um, considering the creation of some sort of a, a parallel or ad hoc board that would be able to do that kind of review um, as well as more closely monitoring the privacy practices of IRB reviewed and IRB exempt or not human subjects research uh, proposals. So that's kind of all the stuff that's going on uh, behind the scenes. It's a lot of work, it's probably gonna take a while, but I, we're, we're in the right direction. That's it, that's all I've got. And I'm sorry that I just basically made somebody else talk, but we, we essentially, that was, it was eight hours of presentation and we wanted to put it into context and kind of get the most, what we thought was most relevant out of it. Um, again, I do recommend you look at it if you have time, especially some of the discussions. They, the way that it's set up is that there's presentations and then afterwards they have a panelist discussion. Some of the discussion that they had was really um, enlightening and it does, it doesn't really solve anything, unfortunately, but it does give you perspective as to why this is so difficult to do.